sales divided by how many sales I lose, or conversely, if I sell another burger, what fraction of those sales are diverted from my rival? Right. So, um, now if the two firms merge with one another, right, that's going to be a cost to the new merged entity. Every time, Bur if, if Burger King and McDonald's are now one company, every time Burger King sells a burger, the company faces a cost, which is the unsold McDonald's burger. And how, mu how much of a cost is that to the firm? Well, they lose the profits that they would have earned on that, the marginal profits, which are exactly their markup. Right? So the oppor marginal opportunity cost to Burger King of selling a burger as that comes about as a result of the merger is the markup that they earn on with the McDonald's burger times the diversion ratio between the two firms. Okay. And this is exactly what upward pricing pressure is. It measures the new opportunity cost created by the fact that the firms have merged. And like any other cost, it gets passed through to consumers, <coughs> and that means that mergers, sort of all other things being equal, will lead firms to raise prices, which is sort of what we thought, right? We thought if we reduce the amount of competition, that firms will tend to increase prices. So this gives us a basic flavor of uh, why mergers between differentiated products firms are anti-competitive. But there were a bunch of things that we talked about in the oligopoly lecture that we sort of left out here that I want to now introduce. So one thing is that other firms in the industry, there are other firms other than these two firms in the industry, and, they're, and we may conjecture that either my merger partner or some of these other firms might change their prices when I change my prices, rather than them staying prices. So adding this is relatively simple given what we've already done. So let's define a firm's residual demand as their demand function taking into account all the ways they expect the other firms to change their prices when they change theirs. So then we can just sort of like Q I sub I, the derivative of that firm's price with respect to its own, uh, that firm's quantity with respect to its own price, be the um, ratio, be the deriv total derivative of quantity with respect to price, which is the same as the partial derivative of quantity with respect to price, plus the sum over all the other firms of the effect of changing their price on quantity times how much me changing my price changes their price. And post-merger though, when firms are choosing their you know, prices, they're no longer going to think of the other firm that they merged with as potentially reacting, because now they have control over both of them. And so, um, we now need to uh, figure out what it means to hold fixed the price of my other partner while allowing all the other firms in the industry to adjust. So, <laughs> I'm going to skip the, the messy mathematical definition of exactly what that is, but the basic idea is we can think of what happens when one firm increases their price and it, they adjust the price of the other firm to make sure it stays fixed. And then what happens to all the other prices in the industry. And let's call that QI sub I tilde and QJ sub I tilde. That's the derivative of I's quantity with respect to their own price holding fixed the price of their merger partner and allowing all the other firms to adjust as they conjecture. And this is the derivative of the merger partner's price with respect to their price, quantity with respect to their price, holding fixed their price and allowing all the other uh, quantity <coughs> prices to adjust. Okay, so then in those terms, the first order condition is exactly what we had before after the merger. Um, it's just evaluated with these different derivatives, with the, these tildes of so, so what is the relevant equivalent of upward pricing pressure now? 
Well, there's going to be two differences between the pre-merger and the post-merger first order conditions. Um, one is the UPP term that we saw from before. But the other one is that when I merge, now I used to expect my rival to change their price. Now I no longer do. So the elasticity of just my own demand changes as a result of that. It changes from epsilon, you know, elasticity i to elasticity i tilde. Right? Okay. So the first term is just a generalization of what we had for UPP. The key difference is that the relevant diversion ratio now is no longer the one that says how much does my rival, how many burgers does my rival sell if I sell an additional burger by decreasing my price and holding fixed all the other prices. Instead it says how many more burgers does my rival sell if I sell another burger by decreasing my price, holding their price fixed, but allowing all the other prices of the firms to adjust as I expect them to. Second, there's a change in the reaction that I expect from my partner. So imagine that beforehand we were sort of polluting, and I thought that if I reduced my price, my partner would reduce his price as well. That <coughs> is going to make my demand more inelastic, right? Because it means if I reduce my price, he also reduces his price, and so I don't get that many sales. <coughs> now after we merge, when I reduce my price, he's actually going to hold his price fixed. That makes my demand more elastic, right? And so that is actually going to be a force that will lead us to reduce uh, prices after the merger. Right? Because my demand becomes more elastic as a result of that. And that's kind of intuitive. Imagine that before the merger we were perfectly colluding. Well, then the merger shouldn't make any difference. Right? And so um, notice that if we have more sort of collusion, this diversion ratio gets bigger. Why? Because for two reasons. First of all, if I expect other firms to increase their price when I raise my price, right, then I'm going to lose fewer sales from raising my price. On the other hand, if my merger partner's price is held fixed, he's going to gain more sales. And both of those forces are going to make the diversion ratio, uh, are going to make the diversion ratio larger. Yeah. I don't understand how the elasticities can change. Because what we're holding fixed when we take the elasticities is changing. So before we merge, right, I just changed my price and I expected all the other firms to change their price in response, right? Once we've merged, I own you. So I'm not expecting that when I change my price, you'll change your price. Because I can tell you not to, right? And that changes the relevant elasticity of demand because whose prices are adjusting has changed. So more accommodating reactions, more sort of collusion, will lead the diversion ratio to be larger, so it will mean more anti-competitive effects, but it will lead my elasticity to rise more when we merge. Especially if I was colluding with you, more than I was colluding with the rest of the industry, this term will rise. <coughs> Especially if I was colluding with the rest of the industry but not with you, this term will rise. Um, and so those two things can sort of be seen as offsetting one another. So to the extent that I'm sort of colluding with you in the right ratio to colluding with the rest of the industry, well, it may not matter that much what the collusion is, how big the incentives for raising prices that are created by the merger. Okay, so how can we actually go about measuring all of this? One approach typically is to use internal company documents. So if you, the government can uh, force the companies to turn over a bunch of their internal stuff, and often companies think about things like diversion ratios, who's our closest competitor, you know, what are the biggest dangers to us, et cetera. Um, a second approach is to look at surveys or I think even more exciting internet data. So you can just ask consumers what goods they would purchase if they didn't purchase this good, etc. cetera. Um, another thing that I think is even better is if you go on the internet, if you go on something like Amazon, it says, 
people who were going to buy this uh, you know, item were also looking at this item. Or if you like this, you might also like that, right? And that can be a very good indicator of how closely competing the two products are. Okay? Another thing you can do is what's called win-loss studies in auctions. You look over a, a bunch of auctions and you say, well, when this firm was like the second best, the second highest bidder, how often was this other firm the first highest bidder? So like that gives you a sense of how closely they're competing with one another. You can also do some fancy econometric analysis where you try to look at changes in costs in the industry and see the effect that that had on demand and try to estimate demand functions that way. Now that can be very difficult on differentiated products Nash and prices because if you have a large number of firms, you need to estimate, you have to get the cost shock to all the firms so that you're able to hold fix the prices of all the firms, right? Because anytime there's a cost shock, all the prices of the firms will change. But what we're interested in what happens is when one price rises and all the other prices stay fixed. <coughs> and so that can be a real mess. Um, a fifth approach, which we'll talk a little bit about later, is using consistent <coughs> conjectures. Um, and the nice thing about that is in that case, you only need cost shocks to the two firms that are merging. Because the relevant elasticities can all be determined by that because the actual responses are what determine what the firm conjectures about other people do. Which we talked about in last lesson. Okay. So, now, what we've been talking about so far is measuring the opportunity cost of sales created by the merger. But often we're interested in the actual amount that we expect prices to rise by. But in fact, we know pretty well how to translate and increase in cost into an increase in price, right? So if only one firm were to raise its price, we would just multiply the uh, increase in cost by the pass-through rate, right? We've done that ad nauseum at this point in this course, right? So this is basically correct, except there's two small complications. So the first is that the merger is not just going to push up the prices of one of the merging firms, it'll push up the prices of both of the two merging firms at the same time. Right? And second, you know, as one firm's prices rise, that might affect the optimal price for the other product by that firm, the, the newly merged firm, or the optimal prices for other firms in the industry. So there's strategic effects. Right? All this can be covered by something called the pass-through matrix, which I'm not going to waste your time defining, but it's basically how increases in costs of each of the individual firms translate into increases in prices for all the firms in the industry. So then if we take, if we make a vector out of this G thing that we had here, so like for each firm that merged we calculate this and make a vector out of that, then if we multiply that by the pass-through rates that'll tell us how much the firms change their price. Um, don't, you don't need to follow the matrices, so don't worry about this. But the key point is that you can use the pass-through rates to convert here. And the this is nice because uh, we're going to use this, because this is the same thing, pass-through, that we use for analyzing so many other things, and that we developed you know, a bunch of intuitions about in relations to various characteristics of industries we can use. And, um, and this also makes it easy to measure because the same changes in costs that we use to think about the diversion ratios and so forth can be used if we can see their effect on prices to measure uh, the pass-through rates. Okay. So, um, uh, Ben. Yes, Ben. Ben, uh, how? Don't don't look. <laughs> how do? We change once we know how much the price has changed. How do we know how much that hurts consumers? Uh, so we have to we have to take the room of we do, we have consumer welfare, so we have to see what um, under the yeah. And what's the rule that we've used a bunch of times about how much consumer surplus changes when prices change?
Okay, what's the derivative of consumer surplus with respect to price? Uh, 